Thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's really great to see so many people here um, interested in uh, talking about the issues you do at UltraConf. Um, I've spoken at a couple of conferences before and it's kind of, uh, it's nice to come to UltraConf because uh, here I feel like I don't have to make, you know, let's, let's decolonize the internet, the subtext of my talk. I can actually make that just the direct uh, topic of my talk instead, uh, which is a nice change. Um, on that note, I was actually, though, looking at my slides uh, just this morning, um, and I realized that uh, there are no content notices noted for the talk. Uh, there is a, um, uh, but I found that there is a brief um, uh, reference to xenophobia uh, at some point, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, sorry for not mentioning that before. But in any case, uh, we're all here today because we want to break down barriers in the tech industry. And I'm here to talk about one specific kind of barrier, language barriers. And it's something that means a lot to me because it cuts right to the heart of why I write open source software, and I think a lot of others would agree. Technology is a phenomenally empowering force, especially when we make it free and open. And the people that it can empower the most are the people who are disenfranchised, politically, economically, medically, or otherwise. I'm a statistician, and I'm an engineer. That's the work that I do. But in the work that I do, what drives me is that I always strive to keep an eye on how the technology can empower the disenfranchised or how it can amplify the voices of the subaltern. Uh, oops. Ah. Whoa. Sorry. Uh, yes, that would be great. I just can't find the mouse. Uh, it might be easier to use this guy. Ah, OK. Perfect. Get to wherever you need to be. Yes. Uh, Spoiler alert. <laughs> so it's crucial to listen to those voices because if, if we want to solve the biggest problems that the world faces. Um, in product development, one of the fundamental rules is that you have to understand the end users. And it follows very naturally from that that the people who are best equipped to solve the world's biggest problems or even to identify them as problems in the first place are the ones who experience them. And from my time working in venture capital, I can tell you that the people who are the, be the best pitches come from people who have personally and firsthand experienced the pains that their product aims to solve. But this is a problem uh, because 95% of the world doesn't speak English as their first language, and 89% of the world doesn't speak English at all. So this means that if we think that software can solve the world's biggest problems, writing software needs to be an option for everyone in the world experiencing uh, the world's problems. So you can look at this visually as well. This uh, shape right here, it's actually a circle, though the map projection makes it look like it's not. More than half of the world's population live inside uh, the, uh, that, that circle. That's more people live inside that circle than outside of it. One fifth of the world lives in China, and another fifth lives in India. But that's not what the open source world looks like. Only 10% of the world's programmers uh, uh, live in China. And only one, as of 2014, only 1.4% of Stack Overflow visits came from China. So that raises the question, where would the other 86% of programmers in China go? And the answer is that they'd go to Chinese language versions instead. Now some of these are direct clones of Stack Overflow. There's a website that's literally called Stack Overflow in Chinese. But there are also other community resources of all forms, just like we have in English. And this isn't just a phenomenon unique to Chinese either. There are resources targeted at speakers of Arabic, Russian, German, French, Spanish, you name it. And it's great that Chinese programmers have developed these thriving communities for themselves. But fragmenting resources is bad for open source development, both in code and in the community. Fragmentation means duplicated work and incompatible interfaces. It leads to wasted time and, and duplicated effort, solving the same problems over and over again with only minor variations. So how do we defragment open source software development? Well, one possible approach is to use a common language. It's also known as a lingua franca. If we wanted to standardize around a single language, English would seem to be the reasonable choice since it's already so widely used by open source projects. But that poses some problems. First, English is difficult to learn. And objectively, that's why we have the situation we have now, where it's easier for non-English speakers and non-native speakers to develop their own communities to duplicate all this work than it is for them to participate in the English-speaking communities. And secondly, we think of English as a, uh, as a single language, 
But in reality, there are all sorts of different dialects and registers. If we wanted to standardize around, uh, around a common language, we'd have to standardize that as well, and that's impossible. This is actually the reason that the very first lingua franca, the Mediterranean lingua franca severe, died out. It didn't actually die out so much as its usage grew across the Mediterranean, and as that happened, it fragmented it, and it ended up influencing the local languages instead, like Portuguese and Italian. So it's much better for us to embrace multilingual workflows rather than fight this uphill battle against linguistic divergence. Languages diverge, and they evolve. That's what they do. And it's no secret that this is what we do for programming languages uh, as well. Uh, you can look at, for example, JavaScript, which is, uh, taken on, which has grown in popularity. As that's happened and it's started to be used on different sorts of platforms, we've developed things like TypeScript and CoffeeScript, which are variants of it. Uh, C++ was originally a variant of C, and now it's a language unto itself. It's actually more than one language if you count the templating language as a second one, which, which I would. <laughs> so how do we make our code multilingual, and what does it even mean for us to make code multilingual? Well, for that, we can look to Grace Hopper, who was one of the first uh, computer scientists, and she wrote the very first compiler for a high-level programming language. The language she invented was called COBOL, and the goal was to have English-like natural language syntax so that business executives could write code. And she received incredible pushback about this. Engineers were furious. You know, well, if engineers, you know, could, if businessmen can write code, then, you know, this could put us out of a job. That's what they thought. But her vision actually was, uh, went even further than that. She thought, well, what if engineers who spoke other languages wanted to write programs? She wanted to, COBOL to be, and I quote, a language you can use to talk to programmers around the world. And the response to that was even more vitriolic. Uh, they basically said, well, now how do we teach American computers to run German programs? And to be clear, this isn't a question of how it could be done technically. Uh, this was a decade and a half after World War II, but still the fear of a threat from Germany or Russia still looms strong in people's minds. But even if Hopper's idea was put in the back burner due to xenophobia and politics from the 1950s, we can still look at what it means today. This is Hopper speaking many years later about COBOL. I would have thought that COBOL would be useful to NATO because they had the common verbs for the things that they were going to do. And the nouns... They just have to have a dictionary for the things they were referring to for inventory control. They'd have common nouns throughout NATO, and they can make a dictionary of common verbs and translate the program. You could write one in English, and you could translate it, and it could go to the other language. No problem, you'd have communication. It would be a limited vocabulary. Now, COBOL was written before uh, structured programming had actually caught on as a concept. Um, today, we take it for granted that well, uh, well-written programs have things like loops and, and uh, functions and subroutines, but that actually wasn't really known in, uh, in Hopper's time. But putting COBOL aside, we can look at Hopper's vision. What would her vision look like for a modern structured programming language? In other words, how might we translate this Hello World program written in Go to a different language? Well, you'd end up with something like this. We've left the identifier names intact, but the uh, keywords are all now in Bengali. So if you speak Bengali, this is great. You can understand this perfectly. But this isn't so great for uh, communicating with Go developers who can't. We need some way to bridge that gap. Otherwise, we're just furthering the problem of fragmentation. Now we have Bengali-speaking Go developers and English-speaking Go developers who can't communicate with each other. So what if we could automatically switch back and forth between the two? And it turns out that we can. Enter Koro. Koro is an extension of the Go compiler and toolchain to support Bengali exactly as I described. The name Koro is a rough translation of the English name Go. And Koro uses Bengali translations of the Go keywords, but otherwise it functions in exactly the same way. Uh, I had a video here, unfortunately, uh, which doesn't seem to have come through, but you can take my word for it uh, that, that it does work. Or you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, you can go to um, the GitHub uh, page and, and try it out yourself. And it actually is capable of translating um, the Bengali code that we saw uh, two slides ago to, in to the equivalent English uh, Go code, which is key. So the same way that I can use Vim as my text editor, while well, you might use Emacs or Sublime, and we should still be able to communicate with each other and work together, you and I should be able to write code together even if we don't speak the same, uh, the same human language. 
having bi-directional translation layers like this means that you don't need to know that I'm writing my code in English and I don't need to know that you're writing your code in Bengali. We can localize our source code using our development tools. And this, in this way, the languages that, we, that you and I speak become no more of a barrier to our, to our communication, to our collaboration, than the text editor we choose to use, or our indentation preferences. And that's the way it should be. But of course, if we leave the function and variable names in English, as most open source projects do, that's not very descriptive to someone who doesn't speak English. Fortunately, many variable and function names are already highly structured. As Hopper mentioned, we already have the common verbs that we use quite frequently when we write code. So we can take advantage of that knowledge and translate those in the translation step as well. We might not get all of the translations for free, but we can get enough of it, enough to get the general grammar, uh, structure, and semantic meaning across, the core value uh, to someone who doesn't speak the same language. Of course, source code is only one aspect of it. Uh, it that's not all it takes to make open source uh, software development and communities accessible to non-English speakers. Anyone who's write, written code for, for long enough has struggled at some point with software that's undocumented or poorly documented. And so if we want to fully bridge that divide, we need to make sure that non-English speakers have access to that information as well. But there's a catch-22 there. How do we open up our projects to languages if we don't have any speakers of those languages already? So we might not have Captain Kirk's Universal Translator or the Babelfish from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but we do have automated tools that can help us out here. And now, I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's amused themselves using Babelfish or Google Translate by trying to translate uh, things into other languages and back again and seeing how it stumbles over idioms or words with multiple meanings. But it turns out that tools like Google Translate can actually work quite well for technical documentation. And the secret there is that we're not looking to translate and bridge all communication between two arbitrary languages. We're just looking to, com to bridge communication for specific, spe specialized technical text within a very specific and narrow context. And it turns out that that's what machine-generated translation can already do very well. So as an example, here's the opening text for the Python documentation of regular expressions. And on the right, we have that same documentation translated into Bengali. And so, of course, if you don't read Bengali, that doesn't look very impressive. And I could tell you, you know, that's a pretty good translation and ask you to take my word for it, but I've already done that once this presentation, so I don't think I can do that a second time. <laughs> so as a proxy for how much information gets lost at each step, let's take the English, translate it into Bengali, take the Bengali, translate that into Spanish, and then take that Spanish and translate that back into English. And let's see how much information uh, actually makes it through that full loop. So I've highlighted the section that refers to the key technical properties of regular expressions. If A and B are both regular expressions, then AB is a regular expression. In general, if you are a match for a string P and another string Q matches B, the string will match ABPQ. It's surprisingly readable, and the third paragraph is spot on. Below is a brief explanation of the format of regular expressions. For more information and a gentler presentation, consult the article Regular Expressions. Now, it's not perfect, but remember that we're chaining together three different translation steps. And in reality, you only need one in order to, to bridge the gap. So now you might be thinking, well, OK, so if automatic translation works so well, then I don't even need to do any work, because they can just use a browser extension and localize content automatically. And the answer to that is no. That's what people are already doing. And we saw the numbers. It isn't working. The reason it's failing isn't just because machine-generated translation isn't good enough. It's because relying on machine-generated translation makes for a really alienating experience. It doesn't make people feel welcome, like they, that, that they're invited to be a part of the community. One of my coworkers said that when he was start, first started learning to program from French websites, it took him years before he felt comfortable to, uh, to participate in English-speaking ones, even though he spoke English. The goal here is to plant the seed is to signal to other uh, to people who speak other languages that you are excited and, and ready to work with them and that you want them to be a part of your project. And once you've planted the seed, you may be surprised by how many native speakers of other languages are drawn to your project. But you don't have to wait. Actively reach out within your project's community. You might not speak Spanish or Russian or Hindi, 
but there's a very good chance that someone who uses or works on your open source project actually does. So you can use the, uh, the key here is that you have to ask. And now it might sound obvious that I'm saying, standing here and saying it right now, but people who speak other languages aren't going to think to offer this unless you, unless you take that step yourself, unless you solicit it. And it doesn't have to be anything too complicated. So here's an example. You can file, uh, file GitHub issues, label them. In this case, we've already labeled things, anything that has to do with documentation is labeled docs, but we're also tagging it with Korean, saying that you know, if you speak Korean, if you're able to provide this translation, you can, you can filter by this and see what you're, able to, uh, what you're able to contribute. If you go to almost any project, or sorry, if you go to almost any conference that's organized around a specific open source project, you'll eventually hear a talk about how, you know, how do we get more people to contribute to, our, to, to this project. And it turns out that asking for community translations is a really great way to get people to make the jump from being users of an open source project to being contributors. Once you have people ex eager and excited to provide local translations, error messages are a great place to start. As developers, we've all, we've all struggled with uh, cryptic error messages. This is, this, uh, even if you're not a developer, you've probably struggled with them at some point as well. And this is one of my particular favorites from Java. It's completely meaningless unless you've seen it before, essentially. But the only thing worse than a cryptic error message is a cryptic error message in a foreign language that you can't even understand. So error messages are a good starting point because they're finite in number and they also have a huge impact on the people who, who read them. And they're also the easiest to solve from a technical perspective because you can leverage existing projects and libraries for, for localization. Uh, they'll take specific uh, concrete textual strings and translate them into a different language depending on the locale. We already have this. We use this in other projects as well. We should use it in open source projects. As, uh, we should use it in open source projects. And documentation is the next easiest. Um, and fortunately, providing alternate forms of documentation that's even condensed also has an incredibly high impact on developers who don't speak English. And we already have an existing model for presenting the same information in different languages simultaneously. Wikipedia does a great job with this. And it's true, it is possible for the information to diverge between different language versions of the same page on a wiki. That does happen on Wikipedia, and so it's bound to happen on a smaller open source project as well. But it's far better to have that divergence exist and centralized as part of the official project than it is to have that divergence scattered across all sorts of different, uh, all different resources across the web with no real knowledge or awareness of each other. A lot of key project communication will happen on mailing lists. And it's hard for developers to be first class citizens in open source development if they can't participate in conversations around project direction or technical discussions. So you should encourage people to, on mailing lists to participate by writing in their native languages if that's the way they feel that they can best express their thoughts. Just as with documentation and errors, if there's a good chance that there already are other people involved in the project who would be willing to help bridge that gap and summarize or translate for them. So here's an example of what that might look like. Uh, it's similar to the Wikipedia uh, example. We, we can provide links on a project archive to alternate forms of the same mailing list post in different languages. You might not get every message translated into every language, but you're providing the space for that to happen when it's needed. And it's far better to have that information exist in, in an incomplete form than it is to not, not to have it at all and to preclude people who want to participate uh, in your project but don't speak English or don't speak it very well from participating in the first place. Now, localizing uh, live events like meetups and conferences is admittedly a bit trickier. Um, for conferences, you want to consider hiring professional interpreters so as to include non-English speakers or non-native speakers. The key is to find interpreters who have experience with translating technical topics, because not all interpreters will be trained in that vocabulary, just the same way that not all English speakers will understand technical jargon. And an alternative approach uh, is, uh, is live captioning, which, uh, as you can see, AlterConf is doing. Uh, I promise I actually had this slide before I even knew that um, Center Knight was, uh, was here providing the captions for this conference. Um, but uh, as you can see, it can be very useful not just for people who don't speak uh, English as their first language, but for a whole host of other people. People who are deaf, people who, have, uh, who are hard of hearing or have ADHD or auditory processing disorders. The list goes on.
so we've looked at a number of different approaches to including non-English speakers more in open source software development. And some of these are pretty straightforward and low-tech, and some involve building new technologies and tools to solve the problem. And as a developer, I'll, I'll say that there's nothing more exciting than being able to build new tools. So if anyone's excited on some working on some of the things I described, like making mailing list archives that can be localized, or working on Coro or a similar project to localize a compiler for language, I'd highly encourage you to go home and do that, or come talk to me afterwards. But let's also not underestimate how effective some of the more straightforward or low-tech approaches can be as well. Because at the end of the day, we're here because we want to have an impact, and because we want to change the world. And while technology is the key to making that happen, social change isn't just about building the fanciest technologies that we can. If you want to look for a different example, look at uh, HIV prevention efforts or the efforts to uh, eradicate polio. Those obviously wouldn't happen without medication or without the vaccines, but in, the, in recent years, the biggest uh, breakthroughs that we've, had, that we've had haven't been around developing brand new medications or vaccines. No, we, we're using the same medications and the same vaccines that we've had for, uh, in some cases, decades. The breakthroughs have come through our ability to mobilize those resources into the areas that are needed. It's providing the, the, the funding, providing the distribution network, providing all of the infrastructure around that so that technology can actually have the impact that it needs to. So we need to mobilize the technologies that we already have in order to really make programming accessible to people, uh, uh, to people of all linguistic backgrounds, regardless of, uh, regardless of whether or not they speak English. So it's true that I do believe that open source software can change the world, and I hope you do too. But in order for that to happen, we need to make sure that writing open source software is an option for, for everyone, not just, the, uh, not just those of us who speak English as a first language or those of us who are, who are in this room and can understand this talk, but for everyone as well. And of course, we need to actually commit ourselves to doing that. So thank you. <laughs>